leave it for you. Here you go. All right, here we go. All right, so here's your uh, rules committee. As you can see, uh, Teresa Wims is our basketball um, representative. Um, really, any of these folks, if if we uh, if you need us to contact them, um, you uh, you just let us know, and we can and look at different rules or interpretations. So, all right, so um, a couple huge rules changes actually not at all but um, the biggest thing is the ball shall have a deeply pebbled a uh, granulated surface with horizontally shaped panels bonded tightly to the rubber carcass okay so i'm not too sure what happened was nike came out with that ball that looked like a golf ball um, and in fact we had a couple schools last year that tried to play with it and what we did was uh, so we really had never seen it and so uh, because we weren't sure we kind of uh, didn't allow these teams to play with it well it turns out that the NFHS didn't want uh, these schools playing with it either um, in fact um, Nike actually told the Federation look we're going to discontinue the ball so why don't you go and put it in your rules change so that um, we can uh, mm -hmm we actually have a reason to discontinue. And that was an inside source from the Federation. Look, look at Nate Acosta. All right. So, um, but really, um, it should have this NFHS logo on it. Um, and it can be uh, any of these three colors. Um, usually we just see this brown ball. And the most common that we see out there is that Wilson uh, basketball. That is also the basketball of our state championships. Okay, frozen. This isn't good. Second time. <laughs> Dana's got Mac jokes over here. Okay, here we go. I think we're good. <clears throat> Interesting. I apologize. He wanted to use his fancy computer. Let's see. <laughs> that looks like Coach Gillespie in the background. <laughs> uh, play from the current slide. All right. Yeah, see it still? Okay, good. Okay, here we go. Where are we at? We opened up the wrong one. Wow, come on, Nate. Okay, here we go. All right, so um, the next thing is the backcourt um, rule that I believe that we've been refing this play, we've been officiating this play um, pretty much to what the rule is now, okay? And what it says is the player shall not be the first to touch the uh, – uh, ball after it has been in team control in the front court. If he or she or a teammate last touched or was touched by the ball in the front court before it went to the back court, the exception is any player located in the back court may recover the ball deflected from the front court by the defense. Okay. So the first time I read this, I was like, wait a minute. How is that any different? How is this a rules change? So um, I actually had to call the NFHS and, and get um, an interpretation. So they actually just changed the rule to accommodate how we've actually been officiating this play. So we've always, you guys have all seen the, in fact, you know what, let me go ahead and. All right, yes, can you guys see me? Yeah, we've all kind of been, we all did that. And yes, Gillespie, I'm wearing a Yankee shirt. <laughs> So um, we've all done this when the ball has been deflected by the defense. Um, well, it was my understanding that once it was deflected, uh, um, anybody could go to the backcourt and grab it. Well, it was it all was dependent on the status of the ball. So if the so if the ball actually hit, it was deflected by the defense, hit in the front court. Right, it had front court status, and then 
the offensive team recovered, that would have been a backcourt violation, if that makes any sense. So because the ball had front court status, well, now the rule just simply says if it's deflected, it's free ball, uh, free game um, at that point. So really not much of a rules change. Just know that if the defense is the last to touch it before it goes into the backcourt, then um, either team can recover. Um, if, obviously, again, if, if it's deflected by the defense, touched by the offense, and then goes into the backcourt, um, and offense recovers, that would be a, a backcourt violation. So not much to the change. <coughs> wow, and I can't stay on each slide too long because it freaks out on me. Well, this is no fun. Ah, look, here we go. We want to go 20 slides. Can you guys see that? Is that better? I mean, I think, I don't think I'm going to get frozen. Okay. All right. So, again, this is a good example. Deflected. Um, this would, uh, this was legal. And it was already legal. So just some diagram, nothing, okay? Uh, the screen rule. Um, just make sure that in order to set a legal screen, you have to be in bounds. So if you are on that boundary line, um, that would be an illegal screen. It doesn't matter if they have met all the requirements to set a legal screen. If they are on that boundary line, it, it is considered an illegal screen. So in, the, in this diagram, it's just showing this is legal. She's on the boundary line, so we are illegal. So, all right, done. Rules changes. You guys are good? You guys going to have a perfect season? Yeah. All right, let's keep going. We got some points of emphasis. Um, the NFHS uh, Basketball Rules Committee has identified three areas where it feels the rules um, in place are appropriate for the level of play but need renewed emphasis and skill level. Okay, and the ability of players continue to improve, players attempt to um, duplicate actions performed on other levels. So talking to one of the gentlemen on the Rules Committee, really what they wanted to do this year was go back to the fundamentals of what we do. They really want us focusing on, on just the basics. And, and it, it was kind of interesting because when Dana and I sat down and discussed uh, last season at the end of the year, that was one thing that we really wanted to emphasize this year was just really getting fundamentally sound statewide so that we are all on the same page. Um, I think that if you go to the Northwest and the Southeast and the Southwest and the Northeast, Central, we're all kind of doing something different, and we really want to get back on the same page. And so, you know, it was kind of cool that the, the Federation was pretty much in line with what we were thinking. So um, we really uh, – they really want to focus on um, pivot foot, okay, and traveling. And the, pro the thing is they're not asking us to go out and look for travels. They're actually – they actually think that we are calling too many travels because they look funny, right? They actually want us to have a really good idea of, of what, a, what a travel is, what, um, what's not a travel. In fact, there was a question um, at the symposium this last weekend talking about, um, well, don't they get two steps? Well, um, Jack Jones, longtime uh, Division One official, answer the question by saying well where in the rule book does it talk about steps how many steps it doesn't talk about they can have two steps or three steps I think that was something that we were taught um, early on kind of like that over the back or the reach you know but it's not about the steps it's, it's about what the pivot foot does and so reminder once you establish the pivot foot okay um, once you establish the pivot foot, the pivot foot can be lifted, okay? Um, it just can't, uh, you just can't bring it back down. In fact, I'm gonna actually play a video real quick 
And uh, right now, I think you guys can see the PowerPoint still. So let me pull up the video real quick and I will do this real quick. I should have had it. I thought I had it open. In a way, videos. While Nate's queuing up that video, um, everyone, I need to know who is logged in as Baca, Marilyn's iPad, and Marla's iPad. If I don't have your names, I can't give you credit. If you could just type who you are in the chat area, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, let me see. I know what I have. I thought I had it, man. I should have been prepared, and I wasn't going to show this video. Just I thought of, I thought about it because it was actually a really good video. In fact, the coach, coach neighbors at Goddard High School, sent this video and asked if um, if this was a travel, and and it's not. And and I thought it was a good video to to show. So let me go and try to pull that up real quick. And if I can't find it in a quick second, I will move on and we will move on to the next. Yep, we're going to go ahead and move on because I can't find it. So um, as, I, as I go through this, I will uh, kind of search for it. So a reminder of a player who catches the ball with both feet on the floor may pivot using either foot. Okay. So it's our job to recognize uh, what the pivot foot is initially. So once we, um, um, we know what the pivot is, then we can, we have an idea of what they can and cannot do uh, with the pivot. So, now, a player who catches a pass in the air and lands with one foot touching the floor prior to the other foot touching, that initial um, foot, that first foot that landed is actually the pivot. So we, we have to be aware of that. All right, legal guarding position, block charge, screening, verticality, right? Um, I think what we've done is we've done a really good job in the last couple years. Um, they've really pushed um they really uh asked us to um work on the hand checks arm bars dribble ball handler uh ball handler dribble plays uh making sure that we're the freedom of movement plays we've we've really done a really good job i think as a state and and the federation has also said that uh most states are doing pretty pretty good so what um what we're getting into now is Legal guarding position, block charge, screening, verticality, what is legal, what is not. Um, once established, the defense can adjust to absor absorb contact to react to play while maintaining that position. Okay. Once established um, and maintained legally, block charge must be ruled when occurring. Okay. Many times a no call is not appropriate as determination must be made. I think where the game is going, and I think all of us have seen it is, is we're looking for a safer game. Um, and it's not, you know, and it's not just in basketball, but I think we see it, we're seeing it in football, soccer, volleyball. I mean, we're looking at player safety um, in all sports. Um, and so they really, if we have a block charge, whoa, somebody's drawing on the screen. It's awesome. Um, so, if we, if we have a block charge or we have bodies hit the floor, we have to have whistles, okay? And it's our job to, to understand the rules of, of guarding, okay? Uh, charging is illegal personal contact caused by pushing or moving into a, a opponent's torso. There must be reasonable space between two defensive players or a defensive player and a boundary line to allow the dribbler to continue uh, in her path, his or her path. So, um, if a defender is defending the sideline and they are six inches from the sideline, it is the responsibility of the offensive player to either go out of bounds or 
go around. So um, we've all seen that play where that, that offensive player tries to squeeze through that sideline. Um, that is the defense's play. I mean, we, those are offensive fouls when, when, when the offensive player is trying to push through those types of plays. So um, it is the obligation of – it is the offensive – it's the offensive player's obligation to, to avoid that contact. Um, a player must be in balance to have legal guarding position. Same thing. They can't straddle the sideline and take a charge. Um, uh, diligence and um, constant review of game video and rules code will help officials be consistent, right? So things that we've already heard, you know, it's our responsibility to watch film and, and get plays. And, and as the year goes on, we're really going to send out some, some video clips and, and things that will help you um, kind of understand some of these, these uh, points of emphasis, uh, federation points of emphasis and, uh, uh, NMOA points of emphasis as well. So again, here we go. Player three has obtained legal guarding position with both feet touching the playing court and he is facing the opponent. Uh, once legal guarding position is established, a defensive player may move laterally or obliquely to maintain guarding position provided it is not towards the player when the contact occurs. The guard may raise hands or jump within his or her own vertical plane, right? Um, I will tell you, we have not done a very good job of refereeing vertical plays and verticality, right? Um, and that's because I think we're still, one, anticipating fouls, and two, watching offensive players. If you watch the offensive player, um, a lot of times those look like fouls because we didn't actually see what the defense was doing. So we need the defense – uh, we need to pick up our competitive matchup, one, and then two, we need to watch the defense. We need to referee the defense in order to pick up vertical plays. Loose ball recovery. This is huge. Again, going back to player safety, um, how many times have we um, had a loose ball and the easiest call for us to have is a held ball, right? Um, um, I mean, this is here we go. I'm going to show you. This is the easiest call. Right here, it's easier to do that than call a foul on somebody, right? Uh, because, right, who wants to call the foul? Well, again, we can't do that anymore. We, we need to start blowing, putting whistles on fouls. We, we need to recognize that, hey, player A had, a, had the advantage to the, to the ball and player B actually – went through that player to get to the ball. So if we can recognize that, I think that we can clean that part of the game up. And that's what the Federation is looking for. Um, again, some notes. If a player dies for a loose ball, gets control of it, and his or her, moment, her momentum causes the player to slide with the ball, there is no violation. It does matter how much distance the slide is covered. Once sliding player is stopped, the player may sit up, but the player cannot roll over or attempt to rise from the floor while holding the ball, right? So, again, if they are diving for a loose ball and they recover, they can slide from baseline to baseline without a violation being called. Now, the second that they uh, roll over, um, um, that would be the violation, okay? So, if they recover on their side or on their back and they slide five feet and sit up, that is a legal play. Now, once they try to get up off the floor, that would be the violation. Okay. Loose ball. Uh, if a player is going for a loose ball, an opponent dives or throws his or her body, which changes the direction of the player going to a loose ball, this must be considered a legal contact and a foul ruled. If a player is in possession of a loose ball and an opponent dives on top of that player, a foul must be ruled. So going back to what I had said previously. Uh, without question, incidental contact is part of, game, uh, part of the judgment in loose ball situations. However, much contact is not incidental in getting the ball, but rather is violent contact with no chance to get the ball. The loose ball situation with players diving or rolling on the floor is a situation where potential for injury increases in proportion to the number of players involved and the amount of time the ball is loose. So 
early and often. So if we allow one player A and player B going for a loose ball, B jumps on player A and then there's no whistle, then then A2 comes in and jumps on B1 and, you know, it just – you keep adding. So if we get the first one and we call that early and often, I think we clean that, that portion of that up. Hey, Nate. Yes. Alvin here. Uh, quick question for you on that on that uh, control for the for the loose ball. If sure. the player with the ball that has the ball rolls on the floor, while there's a, another player opposite team trying to get like a held ball, and he's avoiding that held held ball, would we consider that a travel? Yeah. If they roll, um, remember if they roll. So if they're on their stomach and they roll over to their back, right? Yeah. To avoid uh, a held ball. What's that? While they're trying to avoid a held ball, yep. for example. Yeah, so the rule doesn't change. So if they're trying to avoid the held ball and they roll from their stomach to their back, that would be the violation. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay. okay. Yeah. That would be the, yeah. A loose ball requires uh, contest officials to be uh, on alert for how players position themselves to go after the ball, jumping or piling onto players floor during. Um, a loose ball situation is a foul. Like I said, early and often, um, we can get those, especially early in the season, folks. If we if we manage these points of emphasis early, uh, we don't have to manage them as much as we get into the season. Hopefully, our teams statewide um, um, have caught on to the fact that we're going to call that. Okay, if if I'm calling it, you know, here in the central region, you know, but they're not calling it down in the southwest, well, then we have some issues because our teams are playing all over the state. So let's make sure that we're consistent. That is the biggest thing that we are looking for um, from our office is consistency. Um, and so it, it really, it, it, it takes, it's going to take all of us to just kind of jump on board and, and get that done. So are there any questions about federation uh, points of emphasis before I move on to the, the NMOA points of emphasis? Uh, Nate, this is Kurt. I have a question. Hey, Kurt, go for it. Hey, uh, going back to the uh, stepping out of bounds on a, uh, on a um, screen type thing. Say you're, you're covering someone coming all the way down the court, and when you get across half court, you step out of bounds, and the dribbler sees that, and then he plows into you. What, what, what are you going to call there and say, oh, your foot was out of bounds and the other guy ran into you, so it's a block, or what do we do? That's a block. By the rule and by what the Federation is asking us, if they are on the sideline, it is the defensive player's responsibility to have legal guarding position on the floor. Okay, that's, that's fine. I just want to make sure that, you know, if the foot does go out of bounds and the dribbler sees that, you know, and he's smart enough, he might just plow right into him and – and get the block call then. Absolutely, and um, unfortunately, but we can also defend that by rule, right? Okay. So when coach is upset or um, the player asks, uh, wants to ask you why you called a block instead of a charge, um, you can simply just say you didn't have legal guarding position. Okay. You know? In order to establish legal guarding position, you need to be in bounds. So. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions before I move on? All right. Easy peasy. Um, Bert just said, or can you call two fouls block and then intentional on offense? Um, Bert, I, I don't know if I would in that situation because the rule's pretty specific to say that that defensive player has to be, has to be uh, in bounds. Um, you know, depending on the situation, um, I mean, and the timing of that, I, I mean, I guess it'd be something that you would have to see. I mean, if it was one of those that just, I mean, I don't know, is anybody else, is there anybody that's on right now that might have an opinion on this? Mark just said, but if he steps out of bounds first, then he is out of bounds. Yes. Anybody have an opinion? Maybe a suggestion on maybe how you might want to referee that? Nope. 
<laughs> All right. Hey, Nate, it's Curtis. Hey, Curtis, what's up? Hey, so it's, I think it's potentially the same type of scenario we talked about on Friday where we have an illegal screen and we have the offensive or, excuse me, the defensive player running through that screener. Yep. So depending on how egregious that contact is by the offensive player, I mean, if it's just normal contact, then I think we go with the block, obviously, because that's the rule. But if we have it where it's so overt in the sense of that guy is just, I mean, maybe there's even a knee or, or potentially – you want to call it like a football move and he's running right through him. Maybe you could potentially just to clean up the game for game management purposes, as Bert indicated, potentially you may have two fouls. I wouldn't say, I would say 99% of the time you're going to go with one foul, which would be a blocking foul. But at the end of the day, that's something that you had always have in the back of your mind to manage the game is if that's egregious enough, then a double foul would not hurt the game. That's just something that I, I got you. I feel that. And I think that's something that we could probably support in this office. So does that help uh, Kurt and does that help Bert? Yes. No, that, that I was just thinking of, you know, maybe a baseline drive or something and the defender has his foot, you know, on the line and then, you know, has a good guarding position and the guy runs into him. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I don't know that, uh, that the player honestly has that time. I mean, we've got some pretty athletic kids out there, but I don't know if they would in their mind at that moment think, Oh wait, he's stepping out of bounds. Let me run him over. You know, and and if they if, if they can, then then I think Curtis is right. Then we then we go after that double foul and get him. But I I would I think it's safe to say that that we probably don't have too many of those this year. So, all right, you guys good? Yes. All right. Yes. NMOA points of emphasis. Okay, so really, again, um, when Dana and I sat down and we, we discussed points of emphasis for the year, really it was based on the feedback that we received from our evaluators and our assigners and, and really what we saw not only at the state tournament but throughout the season when we were at games. And, and really, again, the reason why we have points of emphasis is really to get consistent um, at – you know, so that everybody's kind of doing the same thing. So, um, again, we're going back to fundamentals, basics. We really want uh, you guys to understand that that if you are fundamentally sound and you have a good foundation, um, the game really becomes pretty easy and, and you simplify things. You know, um, if you practice good habits consistently, those are the times when um, – when the pressure situations happen, um, you don't have to think about them. That you just get them done. All right. So we've got to start creating good habits. And this year, um, our evaluators are going to be focused on these points of emphasis. Okay. And it's really a baseline for what they want to see from from everyone. And this is going to be statewide. Okay. So let's start with mechanics, basic mechanics, foul reporting. Um, Let's just make sure that we're clearing players uh, and you have a clear line of sight with the score to, scores table. Walking to the table is not the mechanic, okay? Put some zip into your movement, not a sprint, just a little jog, okay? And I'll, I'll be the first to tell you I'm guilty. Um, I have mechanics that tell me to walk to the table, but, but in a high school game, it is my responsibility to adjust and, and and do the mechanics. We we want everyone to be on the exact same page, and we want everyone to look the same. So not all of the, not fifty percent of our officials walk in, and the other ones jogging. We want everyone just jogging to the table, just a little jog. Okay. Um, also, it's important that we communicate to the table what the actual penalty is. Um, a lot of times we use our favorite signal. And, you know, a lot uh, for me, um, you know, video on, for me, it's, you know, it's the hit. You know, that's the easy one. Um, in fact, I, I just came from working some middle school games, and, and I don't know how many times I used a hit when I probably should have used a hold or a push, um, but that was easy to, to use the hit signal. So let's just let's make sure that we're practicing and working on that. Get in front of the mirror if you need to.
stopping the clock. Ooh, we have not done a very good job of this. And I'm just as guilty, guilty number two. I think these are more points of emphasis for myself. Because, um, uh, yeah, I, I got to stop the clock, and, and so do you. Um, let's make sure that we are stopping the clock on all violations except a five second violation because it stops itself. Let me turn myself back on. Here we go. So a five second violation obviously stops itself and a 10 second violation stops itself. But all of the violations, out of bounds violation, um, double dribbles, held balls, okay, everything that we have that stops the clock, let's just make sure we're stopping it um, consistently. Is that something we can do? I think so. All right, clock awareness. Um, this is more of a game management and play calling situation. Um, really, we want to we want to become aware of. I mean, we have to be aware of the clock at all times. So what we have done is we've actually given you guys specific mechanics that we will use um, in every single game this year that uh, we have. So um, with thirty seconds. On, on the clock and I want to thank Curtis actually we um, we had a discussion about this um, you know we've all kind of signaled the one minute mark well in that one minute we're probably gonna have five or six different possessions um, and and we tend to forget about the the clock so at 30 seconds let's really start to start thinking about the clock and communicating with our partners um, that we're winding down at the end of each quarter um, with approximately 10 seconds on the clock, the center um, official will signal to their partners that they have clock responsibility. Okay, And with about 5 to 10 seconds remaining during that live ball, the entire crew will lock down and finish the quarter in their respective positions. Okay, So let's if you're the lead, do not, and I say do not rotate, right? Um, because what happens is we put our center in a, in a position that, you rotate, well, now they're, they're in their mind, they're thinking, well, I was the center, but my lead came over, so technically I'm the trail, it's not my clock, and there's some confusion. So we want to make sure that with that five to ten seconds left, we're at, we, we are where we need to be, and our center knows that they have the last second shot. There's no question. Um, game situation at the end of the game, um, if we run into a situation where we have a last second shot, anything, we will get together and discuss it, okay? Um, you know, it might be a good habit, and, you know, early in the season, if it's a five point, six point, ten point game, you know, let's just make sure that, you know, last second shot, at the end of quarter, we come together, we discuss it, uh, everybody in the crew agrees, maybe one person agrees, and the other two don't, whatever the case may be, just have that discussion, talk about the before making a decision, and then notify the table um, with what you've come up with. Um, obviously, we don't have a monitor at the high school level, but this is probably the next best thing we can do. Um, don't be afraid to ask your table um, crew, an alternate, or somebody um, that you know that's at like i said the the timer the the scorekeeper um your partners and try to get as much information on all last second shots is that somebody uh, somebody knocking all right so um game, game management and play con uh coverage on three point shots um Position adjust if need to referee the defender and screening action in your primary. Keep your head up to referee illegal contact. Use peripheral vision to locate the three-point line. Uh, take the shooter up and down uh, to referee landing space and adjust for rebounding coverage. Okay. Um, really where we, we need to – we've done a really good job of watching our shooters all the way up, all the way down, but we, we have to take it to the next step. All right. We've got uh, to gotta really referee that screening action understand how that three-point shooter got open, um, and, and uh, just get better there. Again, I'll send out some video clips um, throughout the year on some, some proper coverage of three-point shots as well as some mistakes that we're, we're making, but uh, we'll get there. So are there any questions? It's, it's pretty basic. 
No. No. All right. So I, I want to put a couple of plays. We put we put them up at the symposium. Um, you know, I know that. Uh, let's see, Curtis, you were there. Anybody else? All right. Okay. So let me go ahead and put these plays up real quick. Let me know if it's. I don't know how fast your internet is and if it's gonna uh, pull up. So let me see. Oh. Um you skip the rebounding slide? Oh, I did skip the rebounding slide. Rebounding officiating. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> um, first foul, hooks, holds, and hacks. Okay. Um, really, uh, this is our, our – this is the next big thing, I think, in basketball. Um, we've really done a good job of cleaning up hand checks and freedom of movement type plays um, where we have – failed miserably, I think, and this is all levels, is rebounding fouls. Um, our, our smalls really are, have gotten really creative in how they um, free up their bigs, I guess, in a sense, to, to, to get rebounds. So um, get the first foul. If you see a hold, a hook, clean it up early, often, and, and like I say, I say early and often in the game uh, and the season, we just get it done and and we, uh, we'll, uh, let's work together to get that done. Uh, let's see, uh, you guys have any questions on rebounding fouls? No? All right, let's go. Let's get into the video stuff. In fact, I just, recorded some video today that uh, um, I really liked. So let me open it up. And here's a good rebounding. And again, this is going to be a – let me see. Let me make sure I knew share. All right, let me know how choppy it is, okay? The rules committee continues to keep oh, I'm going to go fast forward to that. I want to get it into contact. Okay. For displacement foul, the ball is on here on the ball. How choppy is that? Pretty clear? Okay, here we go. So again, holds her opponent as the ball is on its way to the basket and as it is coming off the rim. Center focuses on the players on the weak side, which is in his primary area, and calls the personal foul on blue for holding. Correct accurate coverage and signal play. On this three point attempt, Free White moves to rebound the ball and clamps, holds, and displaces her opponent who is attempting to rebound the ball. Excellent coverage by the lead official on the three-point play, and then visually picking up the illegal action in her primary rebounding coverage area. <laughs> in this play, after the rebound is secured, Black 25 body bumps and hacks the now ball handler. The center official stays home, visually picks up the players in his primary, and makes the correct call. Remember, once a player has secured control of the ball off of the rebound, she now becomes a ball handler dribbler, and as such, the rules regarding how she may be contacted by a defender are applicable. Hold your positions. Execute rebounding coverage throughout the rebounding process and keep your eyes on the players. <clears throat> On the first illegal action, excessive physicality will be deterred. The highlighted offensive player moves to rebound the ball and makes illegal contact on the wrist and forearm of her opponent. The center picks up orange 24 as she moves to rebounding position and correctly calls a personal foul. Positioning for open angles, getting your eyes on the players in your area of rebound responsibilities will lead to correct calls and again, deter excessive physicality in the game. Double zero white turns to rebound the ball and uses her left arm to push and displace her opponent. 
in this play, the lead should have been a step wider to have a better view on this illegal contact on the strong side. The trail official stays engaged and has an open angle on this strong side rebounding action. Quality coverage from the trail to call this obvious foul. All right. So pretty, uh, pretty basic. You guys have any questions? Those are pretty straightforward, but we really have to get better at those. Hey, Burton, just send me a question about uh, when did the – Mechanic change for last second shots. That was a, a mechanics change last season. Uh, uh, that was sent out at the beginning of the season, and it's actually in our mechanics manual. Um, in fact, we had we had we're gonna have to make a revision because in the very back of the manual there was it, we didn't make the change. Uh, but in the when it talks about re, uh, last second shots somewhere. Uh, in, in the main portion of the mechanics manual, it does talk about the center uh, taking the last second shot. So I hope that answers your question, sir. All right, so let me go ahead and pull up uh, a couple of those. You make the calls. I won't go through all of them. I just kind of want to make sure that – <clears throat> Curtis, you want to get on and talk about what you talked about uh, at uh, the symposium? Do you mind playing this video and then playing the yep. uh, women's? I think it's a women's game. Yep. You want me to play that one now, or do you want to explain this one first? Yeah, play that other one, and then I'll, and then if you can roll back to this one, if that's possible. Yeah, let me uh, pull it up real quick. Uh. Got to find that first. Yeah, I'm going to play this one one more time just so that you guys have something to watch while I'm looking for this other play. And as those plays are running through, both of those you make the call it plays are the question is whether or not white and I forget the other color where the video comes up, whether or not that team had possession of the ball and whether that foul that the referee called constitutes free throws if the team was in the bonus. So if, as you're looking at this play, you make the call at play, you can start asking yourself whether or not white zero had possession of the basketball or he did not gain possession. And therefore we have a sideline throw in. So you can ask yourself on, on this one, uh, maybe ask yourself what you would be you know, talking to yourself about or your partners potentially if there would be free throws. And then as Nate pulls up the other video, you'll see, uh, I don't want to call it similar, but it's, it's a you make the call it whether or not they have possession for a 10 second violation. The focus is on that blue player. On blue 10 is who we're looking at. So both plays are similar in a sense, and, and you're asking yourself whether or not um, – blue had possession of the basketball or in the previous play whether white had possession of the basketball so the way i broke this down in, in particular the first play um was that white zero and as you and, and put yourself as a basketball player sometimes and as you played the game it makes it a little bit easier to referee white in my opinion white zero in that first video actually caps the ball he controlled the uh, controlled tap, if you will, 
So he taps it forward going towards his basket. And in my opinion, he gains control. So as he as it jars loose here, see his right hand tap it to his left, takes almost a almost a dribble, and then he's fouled. To me, as a basketball player, that's a controlled uh, – you're in control of the basketball at that point. And I know it's very tough. You can look at it in various ways. But in my opinion, that is a controlled tap by zero. Therefore, that if I was a referee on that play that called the foul, I would, I would say that White would be in a bonus shooting free throws, whether it be two shots or one shot. So talk about this, uh, this control. And as we go to this one, now this is a 10-second violation, whether or not it changes in a 10-second three sets – if you play back this this video a little bit, Nate, you'll kind of see it's she's going to possess the ball and try to control it with a dribble or a tap. Um, in my opinion, as she's trying to gain control, she's falling backwards. So therefore, I would not um, constitute that as possession or change of possession. And therefore, to me, that would be a 10-second violation. The two differences that I see in these plays is that one, white zero is going towards his basket, in my opinion, uh, controlled, he, he taps it towards his basket. This one, uh, blue 10, is falling backwards and, in my opinion, does not gain control. If, if blue 10 would have been going towards the basket, my opinion might have changed. So that's something to kind of put in your game a little bit. Um, you know, if you play the game great, it kind of gives you a, a, an advantage. Um, if you haven't, put these in your toolbox in the sense of, is this player going to the basket with a controlled tap? And I know they're very quick. But, that's, that's a reality that we, that we face as uh, basketball referees is we have to make decisions pretty quickly. That in my head, I, it, it, the first time I looked at it, I said that's a control tap, that's a free throw. So put that in your game, and that's how I would break these two plays down, is a control tap going to the basket as opposed to a tap falling backwards on her, on her butt um, and not gaining possession of the basketball. So the one thing I want to point out is uh, after talking to Chris Rastatter on this play, um, they actually ruled it as a – he actually turn, he overturns his call and he, they, they go with a throw-in. Um, I think probably after looking at it, they, he would agree with uh, Curtis and say that it was controlled on video. But the deciding factor here is that his partner came in, and this is what we really want you guys to do, is, is his partner comes in and just gives him information or asks the question. Hey Chris, do you have? Uh, did he have control? Did he have? Did, do we have team control? Right, because at this point, Chris isn't worried about the control portion of that. I think he's looking more so at contact. Right. So if we come in and we communicate with our partners, we don't have to go in and say, "Hey Chris." They had control unless you know you have definite knowledge, but at least I'm bringing information. Okay. Did Chris, did he have control or Chris, uh, do we have team control? Are we sure we're shooting? You know, and Jack, Jack Jones brought a, a great point up at the symposium. He said, if you're walking 90 feet to the other end of the, the floor to shoot free throws, you probably want to think about why you're going to the other end of the floor to shoot those free throws. Okay. So just something to, to think about. So I'll give you guys one more play um, as we are really starting to run out of time. I don't want to keep you guys more than an hour. You guys are getting off pretty easy. And I think we're going to go, what do you think, uh, Curtis, the screen? Yeah, you know, the screen works. Play that one. Coast to coast. Go the other way. All right, what do you got, uh, Drew? Drew, you spoke up. What do you have? Go the other way, man. Big time call. You got an illegal screen? Yeah, I got an illegal screen. All right, I'm going to pick on some other faces. I see Bobby's face. Bobby, what do you got? Hold on, let me unmute you real quick. What do you have? 
Look at her knees and look at the way she's leaning in. I got an illegal screen. All right. Let me see who else. Who, who's face? I see Candace's face. What do you got, Candace? Illegal. Illegal. What makes it illegal? Well, I thought she was still moving. She can give her um, time and distance. Oh, time and distance. All right. Um, Stephen Parr, what do you have? Illegal. She's stepping forward after the screen's over. All right. Wayne, what do you have? Uh, illegal. Wayne says illegal. Nobody said legal, huh? Anybody? And I don't see any other faces. Let me see. Actually, I'm going to ask the rookie, Mike Houston, what do you have? Is your mic on? Nate. Mike, can you hear me? I say legal. Mike Houston says legal. All right, folks, we got, we've got somebody to stir it up. All right, so let's go back and let's break this play down. <laughs> All right, let's see. Does anybody have the rule book in front of them? Yes. Who's, who said yes? I did. Who's I did? Steve, par. Oh, Steve, uh, rule 440, screening. You're asking me to look in the dark here. To coast. Ah, uh, open up your other rule book. Wrong rule book. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. I don't have the new, I, I don't have the new one yet. But oh, the, that's that's that uh, the assistant to the commissioner of officials' <laughs> fault. <laughs> Hold on. It's my understanding that the shoulders can't be, or the feet can't be more than shoulder width apart. She has to be set. She has to give her time and distance. Uh, but her stepping forward is what I think makes it illegal. Okay. Drew, Drew Hatley, I just got totally distracted by your baby. Super cute. Oh, waiting. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to actually read uh, um, Article uh, Rule 440, Article 5. When screening a moving opponent, the screener must allow the opponent time and distance to avoid contact by stopping or changing direction, right, when, while screening a moving opponent. Can we all agree that this is a moving opponent? Agreed. <laughs> the speed of the player to be screened will determine where the screener may take his or her stationary position. The position will vary and may be one to two normal steps or strides from the opponent. So let's do this. Okay, there's step one, right? Oh, and and I'm on a different uh, player, so I can't actually slow it down for whatever reason. Let me see. One, two and a half. Boom. And that defender and that screener is actually still moving, correct? Correct. Yes. Mike, would you like to change your mind? Well, I could I could maybe change my mind again. It's it's you know when you can stop it and look at it, it's a lot easier to call. But I would see as a coach. Now I'm talking as a coach. Okay, you're, we're okay with that. Because <laughs> you're on you're, the dark side now. Yeah, well, yeah, I know. But you, you're penalizing you're penalizing the the offensive team because the white team isn't doing their job. That's the way I look at it. The white team should have called that screen, huh? Absolutely. Yeah, the, I agree. The, the girl who's guarding this, I mean, that, I mean, if I was coaching the um, the white team, I'd be pissed at the girl that's that uh, is guarding the girl setting the screen because she didn't say anything. She had her, her teammate's head taken off. But I can I can see you know the the rule as you're as you're looking at it, and it's correct. She's she's leaning forward. She does you know her her base is too wide. Um, so yeah, I could see the moving screen for sure. 
Okay. All right. Um, you know, we talk about this and, and, um, I'm going to let, I'm going to actually let Candace break this one down. Where are you at Candace? I got to find your face again. I'm there you go. All right, Candace. Uh, let's talk about coverage. Trail lead C. Let's go back a little bit. I'll put you on the spot. But in real time, I wouldn't have called that. <laughs> no call. I'll just be. I'll just be honest. Nothing. You better either have a block or some. You better have a whistle on that. Either way, that player just got her ass taken out. <laughs> okay. I want to say that she threw an elbow too to push her off. Well, I don't that? care about. I don't even. That's not even what I well, first realized. Hold on, language, because this goes on recording. <laughs> There was no time and distance. Okay, so all. hold on. Who who said uh, the elbow? I did, Kurt. Okay, Kurt. Let's see. Is is there an elbow or is there a? It doesn't extend them. Or is that like a? Oh, I'm about to get run over. Boom. <laughs> Where's Aaron? Is Aaron on here? I think she extends them. I let's see. Let's get the. I zoom in on it. Hold on a second. She's running. She does not. She, she turned her shoulders. If so she's she get, taking, if, if she had absorbed some of that hit, she'd have got. She should get the call. But yeah, I don't think she's extending. I think she's just. Uh, I, think she's, girl. I mean, that girl's running. She should have ran her over. <laughs> Oh, that's that's tough. Well, the I'm gonna end this because we we could have a pretty lengthy discussion on it. But obviously, the trails got this matchup right. This um, the trails got this competitive matchup. He's calm. This is hard because the C obviously is probably trying to you know pick up this play as soon as it crosses the division line but we have to recognize that see that there's something coming i mean obviously trail has this play up until c's ready to accept it if c is referring here i i don't think that this this center official is surprised by the contact i think what happens is He's watching the defender, white jersey, and then, boom, all of a sudden, there's a wall. Um, and then this is the next reaction. Look at the – I don't know. <laughs> right? So what, so what you're saying is they didn't call anything on that. There was a no call. Wow. There was a no call on that. Um, Nate, this is Curtis. Hey, so real quick, and it's just personal preference and something that I think about on this particular play. So no matter what, white coach, blue coach is going to be upset. No matter if you if you don't make a call on this play or you ship it. So in my opinion, in my opinion, this is an illegal screen. And I go back to game management. You let this play go and you don't have a whistle on the play. Guess what's going to happen on that next possession down the floor? And I know it's a close game. Potentially you may have – white coming up and doing the exact same thing but in in, in, a, in a worse way if you will uh could have some type of impact as far as somebody getting kicked out of the game i for one would revert back to game management yeah, I, I, have, I have not had a play i think left shoulder in, and left knee five years i think i've had one play it was a high school game rio rancho and i even remember it rio rancho and volcano i think and we shipped the play and we looked at it, it was actually a legal play but to me, it was the right call at the time. And that's combined. In, in game management sense. All right, here's a very similar play. Same side of the floor. Games. Do the math. Is there a 20? All right, let me play that again. Threes, and that's combined in both games. All right, Mike, what do you think on this one? Well, I can tell right now because the action continued. They they called nothing. <laughs> <laughs>
So I, I would have called a block on her because she turned her shoulders. All right, so let's open rule 440, Mike, because I'm going to say that I don't think it says anything about the shoulders turning. Um, it does say that it's – all right, let me let me pull up the different angle. There's a, a second angle for this real quick. Oh, from this side? Yeah. one out there, her head coach, and here's the screen. Just that left shoulder and left knee right in to Nike McClure. Never saw it coming. And the physics of that as far as height and – Yeah, from that upper angle, it looked like she turned her shoulder, oh, but from there she didn't. Just – that left shoulder and left yeah, knee. I think, the, that, I think this one's a lot more legal than the other one. Never saw it coming. Yeah, you're right. She's more set for sure. Anybody disagree with that? With that? No. I think it's legal. Yeah, that one's a little more legal. But, man, those are brutal plays. And we just have to, you know, be on top of it. And, and honestly, I think Kyle is also surprised on this play. Right in. I mean – you see, he's watching. I, I, he, I, I almost want to say he's watching her. He's watching black jersey defender. I mean, he even follows through and watches her all the way to the floor. And the physics of that, as far as height and. So. All right, you guys have any questions for me? Going once, going twice. Hey, thank you guys for joining us on your on this alternate state clinic. You obviously get credit for state clinic. Um, remember, let's just go out. Let's be consistent. Um, let's communicate, right? Let's do a really good job of communicating this year um, with our partners in our pregame. Um, when we, we talk about going back to basics and back to fundamentals, Let's challenge ourselves to really go out and have some solid pregames this year. Um, you know, it's been a while since I personally have, have given a solid pregame, and I think we just get really comfortable and complacent with our crews. Um, but let's make sure that we're taking care of some of these basics and, and in our pregame. So, any questions? Yeah, I want to make sure you take care of me next Tuesday. Hey. <laughs> I'm ready. I, I took I took a rookie out today, and, and he did phenomenal. So I, I'm one for one, Mike. <laughs> all right, we'll see. I could be a challenge for you. Uh, I think I think you'll be all right. So all right, you guys have a good one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.